Yes, hello. Thank you all for coming. Uh, thank you, .NET North, for having me. Uh, my name is Dylan Beatty. I'm a developer and systems architect, and uh, I used to be a webmaster, if anyone's old enough to remember what one of those was. I've been building websites since 1992, which is basically forever in internet years. Um, I'm one of the organizers of the uh, London.NET user group. My uh, website is at dylanbeatty.net. I'm email dylan at dylanbeatty.net. I'm on Twitter as Dylan Beatty, which is the best way to kind of grab me if you have questions about any of the stuff we're talking about tonight. And for the last, uh, coming up on 15 years now, I have been working for these people, Spotlight, who are a company that's based in London. They are a, effectively a recruitment service for actors, professional actors. So a lot of the kind of professional hands-on experience I've got is working on this very interesting combination of technology and show business. It's an interesting database because the most important table in it is full of real people. And they're real people who will phone you up and complain when you get things wrong. And you learn a lot about sort of building systems and evolving systems and things when the records that you're dealing with are also people who will get in touch and let you know if they don't like what you're doing with their, with their data. Um, we are actually hiring, by the way, if anyone is interested. Um, we are based in London, but if anyone fancies a move down south where the rent is really, really high, <laughs> jobs.spotlight.com, check it out. We're looking for a tech lead. We're looking for a front-end developer. Great team, really interesting company. And we don't do all the things I'm going to talk about tonight, but we try. So <laughs> um, now, Spotlight is a show business company, and every, every industry has its kind of default clip art. It's the thing that agencies always put when they do a pitch to you. And ours is this. This is the, the Greek theater masks of comedy and tragedy, happiness and, and sadness. Um, and the reason I, I sort of picked this to open the presentation with is what I'm going to be talking about tonight is happiness. You know, the idea of developer happiness. Now, I want to be clear, this is not a talk about, you know, mental health or anxiety or depression or anything. It's a talk about how not to be pissed off. It's a talk about how to go to work, work on the stuff you're doing, deliver value, and you know, go home on time feeling like good things happened today, like you did good stuff and you, know, you delivered value along with the rest of your team. One of the, I think, the most accurate indicators of whether a project is gonna be successful or not is whether the people working on it seem happy, whether the people working on it are kind of positive and optimistic about what it is they're doing. I've seen projects that you would have thought were brilliant, you know, a really solid business case, an interesting problem, good funding, nice offices, and they just sort of collapsed over a, you know, one, two, three months until six months in, nothing had shipped and everyone was grumpy and fed up with the whole thing. And I've also seen projects where you think there is no way this is ever going to work. And then a couple of people have been like, no, come on, we can do this. And they've come up with some solutions. They've fixed the problems. They found the things which were frustrating them and they've engineered their own solutions to those frustrations and they've actually ended up shipping something, you know, really, really good. And so what I'm interested in is kind of those patterns, how do you engineer your way into processes and architecture and code and, and sort of a development life cycle that is fun to work with, that is, it sort of leaves you feeling happy and productive and optimistic. So there's a couple of things I'm going to talk about. One of them is the idea of discoverability. Now discoverability is, it's a term that comes from uh, learning and psychology. It's the ability of, of things to be found. You know, it's this, it's creating systems where somebody feels, I can play around with this safely. I can discover how this system works for myself. I feel like the system wants me to explore, wants me to play around, wants me to see what the capabilities are. So that's one of the themes. The other thing that we're going to be talking about is the sort of psychological models of learning. Now there is a, a neurotransmitter in humans called dopamine. Dopamine is the addiction chemical. It's the thing that, you know, when gamblers are gambling and they win, it's, they get out this rush. If you've ever been, you know, stayed up all night having just one more go on Mario or Tetris or whatever, every time you get a little bit further and you get that little buzz, that's dopamine. Dopamine is also released when people solve problems. If you're anything like me, and I suspect most software developers, you'll have spent a large part of your life kind of solving problems and thinking, hey, that's cool, I fixed it, what can I do next? You know, it's that, that little buzz you get when you've been up all night trying to get a piece of code running. And it's not like it works immediately, but every time you try something, you just get a little bit further and you get that little buzz, and that little buzz is what hooks you in and keeps you coming back until you're still there at half past three in the morning going, I've almost got it, I've almost got it, you know. Um, 
Now, I'm not going to debate the ethics of building systems that get people hooked on learning them, but I think as a productivity tip, there's a lot to be said for it. If you build systems that are so enjoyable to work with that people actually want to keep coming back and you know, exploring and learning the, the things that you built. And so that's the other, the other thing we're going to be talking about, is how you can build these sort of little, uh, not puzzles for the sake of puzzles, but how you can turn the task of learning a new code base or familiarizing yourself with a new platform into something that feels a little bit more, more like playing a game, something with challenges and reward and feedback loops and things. So I want to start by talking about learning curves. Um, so by, by here we have two learning curves. There are no units on these. These would not pass A-level physics. But a learning curve is basically a way of saying experience is how long have you been working on a thing. Expertise is how good are you, how competent, how proficient are you at working with that tool or that system. Um, now we have two here. We have the, the, the blue one here, which is a very steep curve, and we have a red one, which is a shallow curve. Uh, give me a show of hands. How many people think that the blue curve is better? How many think the red curve is better? <laughs> now, the point about these learning curves, you know, you, you get this, this sort of, people say, oh, it has a really steep learning curve when they're talking about something that's difficult. That di steep learning curve does not mean it's difficult. What a steep learning curve means is that you have to work very hard, but you will get very proficient very quickly. This is someone teaching themselves Haskell in a long weekend. This is someone who's been using Word for five years and they still don't know what a section break is. You know, the point about learning curves is that this is fine. You know, it's smooth. It's difficult, but if you work hard at it, you will get very, very proficient, very, very fast. This here is a much sort of slower curve. You'll spend a lot of time with the system before you really get to the point of being being comfortable as a, a sort of power user. Up here. Now, when we create systems that other people are going to have to use, we create these learning curves because they're going to have to learn how to, how to use the things that we're building, whether they're the end users or our you know, developers and so on. Now, what this thing here is, is what we call a localized peak. This is where somebody has done all this work to get up to this point here, and then they've realized that everything they've learned is not actually true, and they can't go on to the next step, the next level of this. Hands up who's worked with ASP.NET web forms. Hands up who's ever wasted a whole day of their life debugging on item data bound. Now, ASP.NET Web Forms is a leaky abstraction. It's a very, very clever thing, very, very clever solution that came out of Microsoft. The thing is, the problem they were solving is, how do we sell web dev tools to VB developers? The problem they were solving was not, how do we build a performant application, uh, framework for developing HTTP applications? So you spend you know, two, three, four years doing all this kind of stuff with, with Web Forms and data binding and all this kind of stuff. And then someone says, oh, can, can we have streaming video? you know, with resumable downloads. And you go, OK, hang on, there isn't a control for that. And, you, and you, you look and you're like, can I download it? Is it a package? And that's when you realize that actually they've been lying to you all this time, and that the web is not buttons with click handlers that run on your server and form runner equals server. The web is about requests and responses and HTTP headers and protocol negotiation. And so you suddenly realize that a lot of the stuff you've learned up to this point isn't going to help you. First of all, you need to throw away all the stuff you've learned. Then you need to go back down here and start again. That's, that's not good. We don't want to create these kinds of localized peaks. Now, abstractions are necessary. But what you want to avoid is abstractions that lead people in the wrong direction. If you think you're oversimplifying or you're having to introduce a, a model that kind of feels wrong to help people get up to speed with what you're doing, you're probably creating one of these localized peaks. Now, the next thing we want to avoid, this is the brick wall. So this is, is as a function. This is a function applicator. And bang, now these are monads. And you're like, sorry, what? And they're like, yeah, you know, a monad is like a type amplifier. And you're like, no, no, come on, back down here. I don't understand what happened between there and there. We've created a discontinuity. It's like, you ever see that thing on Twitter? It's like how to draw an owl. It's like draw a circle and draw a circle and now draw an owl. And you're like, well, what happened there between, between this step and that step? Um, basically, when you, you put a brick wall in your learning curve like that, it, it's basically a, it's broken. You know? There's no way for people to make the transition from this part of the curve to this part of the curve. They get to here, and they're like, well, I, I'm stuck. I don't know what to do now. I'm going to go home fed up and grumpy because I haven't managed to accomplish the thing I wanted to do today, and it's not my fault, and this is a crap system, and I don't want to work on it anymore. And that's when the project that you're working on is going to start gradually sort of falling apart. Now, 
One of the kind of earliest interactions I had with, with this kind of experience was about uh, probably 10 years ago now, um, when alt.net was new and shiny and Stack Overflow hadn't been invented yet and you know, .net was still stealing things from Java instead of stealing them from Ruby. And I was playing with a thing called Castle Windsor. Got any, any Windsor users in the room? Yeah. So first time, I was playing with Castle Windsor, I was like, this looks pretty good. I'd been to a user group talk and I downloaded it and I you know, installed the DLLs and wired it up and I pressed F5 and it went bang, you know, yellow screen of death. And I thought, ah, oh, that didn't. And I thought, hang on, this is interesting. So I want you to read exactly what this error message says. So first of all, it says, looks like you forgot to register the HTTP module. Isn't that friendly? It's not saying, hey, newbie, you have no clue. It's saying, looks like you forgot. Of course, you knew what you were doing. You just forgot. That's fine. You know, I understand. And then it says, to fix this, add, and then it gives you this chunk of XML right there on the screen. At the exact point where you would have hit the brick wall, the person who wrote this exception is like, a lot of people are going to get stuck here because there's something here that is counterintuitive. There's a step here that's not obvious because we're not used to the idea of having to add XML configuration to make C sharp code work properly. But then, you know, that person thought, well, hang on, I know exactly what's going to happen when they get this wrong. I can put the solution in the exception. And so you grab this chunk of code and you paste it into your config file and you press F5 and it works. And you think, this is brilliant. And you think, I love Castle Windsor. The people who built this get me and they understand what I'm doing here. And that's the kind of, you know, experience that I am really keen on everyone trying to create. Now, there's this idea of, of user experience and you know, UX and, and user interfaces and user experience design. And lots of developers I talk to are like, well, we have people who do that. And you, know, you kind of do. If you're building a software product, then there are the people who build it and there are the people who buy it, you know, your customers. And yes, there is a, a you know, very, very important discipline of UX design around focusing on those end users, your customers, and what their requirements are. But actually, Every time you create a piece of code that is ever going to get run by anybody, you're creating a user experience. You might not think that those people are users, but if you're building an API, somebody is going to write code that calls your API. If you're building a database, someone is going to get that data out and use it for something. You know, if you're deploying systems to production, somebody is going to be on call when they go wrong and you're on holiday. And all of these people are users. They are users who are relying on your code to get something done. And it's up to you whether they are going to have a pleasant experience when that happens or not. So let's talk through a uh, hypothetical scenario. So you've started work on a new team, you know, new company or new project or whatever, and you get in, it's first day, Monday morning, you go in and they're like, okay, hi, you know, there's the toilets, there's the fire alarms, there's the coffee machine. Right, let's get you started. You need to get the website up and running locally so we can start building some code. And you go, okay. You've got a, a password, so you log in and you've, okay, they have a, a GitHub repository. You go in and there's a thing called website, and there's a thing called website final. There's a thing called website 2017, and a thing called website 2015, and you kind of poke around, and, and you know, none of this looks quite like what you can see on, on their company.com website. So eventually you sort of nudge the person next to you and you say, hey, I'm sorry to bother you. Um, I'm trying to get the website running local, but I can't find the code. And they say, oh yeah, yeah the, the code's in a, in a repository called sales. You're like, what? And like, yeah, yeah, the sales team hired the person who built the website, and so that's where all the, the stuff ended up living. So you clone this, this repository, the sales repository, and you, know, um, you press F5 to try and build it, and it, the build fails because there's a bunch of DLLs it can't find. And you think, OK, maybe it's missing some dependencies. You go and look, and what it's missing is C backslash program files, backslash my company, backslash components, back, and you think, I'm probably not going to find that on Google. That's proprietary. So you, you turn to your long-suffering new coworker and you say, really sorry to bother you again. Um, do you have foobar.dll? And they're like, oh, yeah, of course you'll need that. Hang on, let me, let me share my C drive. So they, they do a, you know, open everyone full control of their C drive. And you go around and cherry pick all the pieces that you need. And you spend most of the morning doing this. And, and then you get to the point where you, you hit go and it's like, if you're lucky, you can keep kind of bothering the person next to you and you can keep kind of Googling the error messages and maybe by the end of the day you'll have made some progress. But you might just get this, you know. <laughs> this is just a, a dead end brick wall error message. There's no way you can go from here, you know. Now, somebody wrote this. 
somebody at Microsoft went, ah, oh, the compiler couldn't decode the binary header on that file. You know what? I can't be bothered to explain. Just throw unspecified error. I want to get out of here and go home. And so, you know, in that moment, whoever created this error message didn't care about all the people who were ever going to see it. Now, I don't know why people build messages. Like, I don't really understand, you know, what is so complicated, the people building it. Like, we don't know what went wrong. We, we just work here and stuff. <laughs> You've hit a brick wall, you know, bang, you're stuck. There is nothing at this point that you, with all of your, you know, your experience and your problem-solving intelligence can do to get past this point other than just start changing things at random and seeing if something happens. And that's not any fun. You know, no one wants to work like that. So, let's do the same thing, but this time we've joined a slightly different company who have all been and watched this talk. So, you get on Monday morning, they say, hey, you know, there's the toilets, there's the fire alarm, there's the coffee machine, right, need to get the website up and running locally. Um, by the way, the website, uh, the project code name for it is Applejack. And you're like, okay, you go onto their GitHub repo, bang, there it is, Applejack. Okay, clone that. While it's building, you go onto their wiki, you type in Applejack, and you're like, okay, this is cool, this project documentation. I understand you know, what, what this system is, what it does. You go back into Visual Studio, you see that it's restoring a bunch of package dependencies. And you're like, hang on, I don't recognize my company.foobar.dll. <laughs> so you go and dig and you're like, hey, that's pretty cool. They've got their own NuGet server. There's somewhere on, on the network here, there is a, a repository of all their private packages. All their DLLs and things have actually been built and published internally. So we're getting half the dependencies off NuGet.org and the other half off this, this server that we've got set up. That's pretty smart. And then you press go and it pops up a web page and the web page says, hey, yeah, well done. Code's working, but you don't have a database yet. Go and look in the folder called SQL in the repo that you just cloned. And you go and look in there and sure enough, there's a bunch of data definition scripts. Now, two things happen here. One, you think, yes, I've solved the problem. You get that little dopamine rush. Now, the fun thing about the dopamine rush is that they've done, uh, psychologists have done studies that show things that you learn by solving problems, you learn them faster you retain that information longer, you can recall it more easily. So not only have you solved the problem, but you've also just learned that there's a folder in that project containing all of the data definition scripts. And because of that little rush that accompanied the discovery, you're gonna remember that. So next time you need to go and check how a particular piece of the database was created or whether there was a change script for something, you'll remember that there's a folder in the source code repository which has all the definitions in it. And you know, by Half past 12, everything's up and running. You've got the website running locally. You're like, all right, let's, let's go and have some lunch, and then we'll come back, and I'll start shipping some features. And as you're going out to lunch, you say to your new coworker, hey, why is the project called Applejack? And he says, oh, we name all our projects after My Little Pony. <laughs> and you're like, what? And he goes, yeah, we just needed a way of naming things that wasn't going to result in arguments. You know, They're just code names. They don't go public. We never show them to customers. Now, the great thing about this, you know, it's a silly name, and it'll sound silly for two or three days, and after that, it'll just be Applejack. And no one will ever care except when someone new joins, and they're like, what? And you have to explain the pony thing. <laughs> but the name gives you a way of exploring the bounded context, you know. Good, mature software architecture is about identifying the boundaries in the system you're building and going, we have this component, we have that component, we have that component. You give the component a name, and you'll be amazed how many things you can suddenly do that would have been really difficult before. You ever had a bug report where someone says the system is down? Or there's a problem with the database, and you're like, we have 17. Which one did you find the problem in exactly? You know? By assigning names to things, suddenly you can do all sorts of cool things. You can give them email addresses. If something fails in the middle of the night, you can get an email from Applejack at mycompany.com saying, hey, you know, I was database latency timed out. I couldn't connect. Um, you can use it for documentation. You can use it for managing code repositories. You can use it for architecture diagrams. Suddenly you have one word to put in all of those rectangles that you draw on the whiteboard. And you're like, this is Applejack, and Applejack is talking to Cherry Blossom, and Cherry Blossom's talking to, and at this point I run out of pony names. But, um, and the point is, you know, don't get too hung up on it. Just come up with a, something that works. I don't know, single malt scotch. Call them after Scottish islands. Call them after cities that you'd love to visit. Just come up with something where you've got a nice list of names so you can always pick a new one when you need one. Now, this was pretty much the first computer I ever used to do any programming on. Um, not this exact one. I found this one on Wikipedia. But it looked like this. And you switch it on. And it would sort of, you know, clunk and grind and complain for about 90 seconds. And then it would come up with this. 
And you'd go, oh, this is interesting. And you'd go, hello. And you'd get bad command or file name. And you'd think, OK, menu. And it'd say bad command or file name. And you're thinking, I, I didn't mean to be bad. You know, I'm just trying to work out how to make this very expensive thing work so I can, I can do computer things with it. And you put in help, and it says bad command or file name. And you know, at that point, you're like, well, I've tried everything I can think of. And so you look in the box, and there's the MS-DOS 4.01 user manual, which was a book about this thick, which is almost as bad as a Dan Brown novel. You know, it's a terrible, terrible piece of writing. And you just start paging through it. And eventually, you get to the page that says, oh, I see. I type DIR to get a list of the files that are OK. There's no learning curve. You know, this is a complete, basically, you've just spent 1,500 pounds on a brick wall. You switch it on, and it says A. And you're like, I don't know, and everything I try just tells me that I'm bad. Um, there was one quite fun thing you could do with DOS, was you could do this with it. You could do, if you're happy and you know it, syntax error. And it would say, syntax error. <laughs> Can you guess? <laughs> so it wasn't completely miserable. Um, now, around this, you know, this sort of period in history, the other computer that people took home to do serious work on was the, the Apple Mac, the older System 7 Macintosh. And when you switched one of those on, you got this. So first, you get this little cute picture of the thing that you just bought. You know, you've got it set up on the desk. And then you get this thing that says, welcome to Macintosh. You think, this is interesting. And you know, the system would, would click and whir and grind away for about 30 seconds or so. And then when it finally booted up, you would get this graphical desktop representation. I should have sped this video up. We can do that now. There we go. And you're like, OK, this is pretty cool. Look, there's stuff here. And it'd take you maybe 15 seconds to work out that if you move the mouse, you can interact with the, the screen. And from that point forward, you never look back, because everything in there is stuff you can click on. And you click on it, and it brings up something that shows you what it does. And you, know, you have all of these visual representations. It is a, in contrast to the sort of brick wall of the, the MS-DOS command line system, this is explorable. This system affords discoverability. It's a system you can play with. There are things you can click. There are things you can look at, things you can read, things you can open. And you start getting, uh, you know, there's a, a menu up here which has file and system. And there's this thing here that looks like a trash can. And there's this thing here that copies disks. And, you know, it's a, a much more kind of explorable system. Now, something that a lot of people will do is they'll go, OK, that's cool. Explorable systems are good. We want to give people stuff they can click on. Let's just make everything a button. And then you end up with this. See? I mean, programming is easy. You, you type your program here. That's how you do it. Um, so th this is Visual Studio 2017 with all of the options switched on. This is almost as bad. You know, what you've done here is you've gone from one extreme to the other. You've gone from a system which is a complete brick wall into a system which is just going to absolutely overwhelm you with choice. Because the first time you run it, the first time you, you open it up, it's like, well, there is a, like a 1,000 options on here. And I honestly don't know which one to click. I don't know which one to use. I don't understand how this, this works. What you want to do is to try and create learning curves that will teach people the, you know, gradually introduce the complexity. You start with something simple, not as simple as A and everything is bad, but also not as complicated as this. You want to start with something explorable. Now, there's one example of this that I absolutely love, which is this. In compliance with state and federal regulations, all testing candidates in the Aperture Science Extended Relaxation Center must be revived periodically for a mandatory physical and mental wellness exercise. You will hear a buzzer. When you hear the buzzer, look up at the ceiling. Good. You will hear a buzzer. When you hear the buzzer, look down at the floor. Good. This completes the gymnastic portion of your mandatory physical and mental wellness exercise. There is a framed painting on the wall. Please go stand in front of it. This is art. You will hear a buzzer. When you hear the buzzer, stare at the art. You should now feel mentally reinvigorated. If you suspect staring at art has not provided the required intellectual sustenance, reflect briefly on this classical music. Please return to your bed.
So that's it's from Portal 2, which is an absolutely fantastic game. That's the very first level. Now, the thing that I love about that is by the time you've played that, you know, it's like a little 90 second comedy riff that also teaches you how to interact with the game world, how to move around, how to walk, how to interact with objects, how to maneuver and all this kind of stuff. And it does it in a way that's fun. It introduces things one by one. And if you get stuck, if you stop, if it's clear that you're not making any sort of progress with it, it'll start giving you hints. It'll start putting up keyboard shortcuts on the screen where you can see them. So I like that because it's a good example. I'm going to show you one that's sort of more relevant now to software development. So this is uh, Microsoft Edge. And uh, so Edge is, is the new Internet Explorer. It's Microsoft's completely new browser engine that's part of Windows 10 and everything. It's actually really, really good. But the first time you fire it up as a developer, before long, you're going to go into it, and you're going to go into a web page, and you're going to go right-click because you want to inspect something, and you're going to see this. And you're like, where's all my stuff? I can't use that. I'm, I'm a serious software professional. I can't get by with select all and print. And so you're going to start poking around. And you click this menu here. And there's a couple of things you notice. One, there's this menu where nothing has a function except this one, which is the F12 developer tools. So you're thinking, OK, F12, I'm going to remember that. And because you've just solved the mystery of where the developer tools went, you're probably going to remember the F12 bit. And when you switch it on, this happens. Inspect element and view source will now appear in the context menu. So the software, by going and activating that, you've basically said to Edge, hey, look, trust me, I know what I'm doing. I'm not going to paste random JavaScript from Russian hacking websites into the console because someone's told me it'll show me who's liked my photos on Facebook. And there it is, you know, these features. So 90% of people who, you know, Microsoft are not selling Edge to developers. They're selling it to end users who have no need for view source and inspect element. But for developers, we don't have to go into you know, about colon config and scroll down and enter some weird hack. They're like, OK, let's make this so that if you know what you're looking for, the first time you hit it, we're going to take that as a hint that you know what you're doing with this system, and we're going to make it easy for you to do next time. Let's have a look at another example. So you've probably all come across this idea of what they call intelligent code completion. Uh, that one. No, nope, that one. OK, skip it. We'll do this one. Um, there are ways that we can include information in our own languages. So intelligent code completion, you're working in your IDE, you type object.something and it pops up this clever little menu that shows you all the things that that object knows how to do. So for console.foregroundColor equals, and we know that that's an enum, it has a certain number of options, and we can attach some documentation to those options inline. Now, you know, we're all very familiar with this. Microsoft's class libraries have IntelliSense documentation for everything. It makes it very, very easy to write code when you don't really know what you're doing yet, because you just pick something that sounds right, and you press dot, and you see if you get any options to pop up after it, which is quite an interesting way of you know, kicking around a new class library or something and, and seeing what, what options you get out of it. Um, now, I'm sure everyone here is familiar with using this as a developer, but how many people have ever actually written their own XML documentation comments to help other people make sense of your class libraries? Yeah. Now, one of the things that I cannot do, I can't write connection strings. I've been doing them for 20 years. They will not stick. There is zero dopamine associated with the syntax of a SQL connection string. So every time I go new SQL connection, I'm like, OK, well, this, this documentation tells me what I need to do. But I can't remember the syntax. And so I have to you know, get out of the zone and go and look it up on connectionstrings.com. So I built a helper function for it, which says here, here is the syntax. This is the thing I can never remember that pops up on my screen at the exact moment I can never remember it. So you don't get stuck. You don't get jarred out of the zone. It's just this little hint that says, OK, I'm going to help you out for just long enough to get you over this, this stumbling block that we know you always have. And after that, you're on your own. And it's not difficult to do at all. So all this is, you know, this SQL.connect is a static class with a static method on it. And it's just got this XML summary documentation on the top of it. And, you know, this is a wonderfully unobtrusive way of creating discoverability in your code bases. Because by doing this, it stays out of the way until the exact moment someone needs it. It pops up right there in front of them at the point where they're stuck, helps them get unstuck, and then it goes away, and they don't see it anymore. So it's a really nice way, you know, by thinking through somebody is using my class library, my open source project, whatever it is that you're creating, someone is going to be using it for the first time. Is there anything you can do with this to help them get past those initial stumbling blocks? You know, is there some configuration you need to do? You can even extend this whole idea into building what we call fluent interfaces 
which is, you know, like connect dot to database dot with these options dot username this dot password that. Where basically every time you get stuck, you press dot and it goes, well, here's all the stuff you can do from here. Now that's another um, sort of pattern. It's something we call signposting. It's the idea of keeping track of where somebody is on some conceptual journey and at any point being able to jump in and say, here are the places you can go from here. Here are the, the options that are available to you at this point in the system. Now, I do a lot of work with um, hypermedia APIs and uh, RESTful systems and you know, the idea of exposing data and services via HTTP and JSON and hypermedia links. And one of the lovely things about working in that way is that hypermedia, you know, the, the reason why the web works, the reason the web's so successful, is you go to a web page and it's full of stuff you can click on. And you click on it, and if it's what you want, that's great. And if it isn't, you go back and you click on something else. It's a very, very explorable system. You know, it feels safe to just go and click around and see what happens, and suddenly it's three o'clock in the morning and you're on the Wikipedia page for maritime disasters and thinking, I can't remember how I got here. But you can do the same thing. You can build the same kind of discoverability into, into APIs. So we have a, a project my team and I have been working on for the last sort of six months that started out as a, you know, a, a API that takes HTTP requests and returns JSON with HAL, hypermedia application language, links and resources embedded in it. Um, and the more we were kind of playing around with this, we started hacking together little tools to help us develop it. And eventually we thought, why don't we just turn our tools into the actual uh, something we're going to ship along with the API? So what we've created is a, an API explorer. So this is a JavaScript application runs in a browser. And all it does, you know, you give it a set of credentials because this API isn't open to the public. It's still secured. We've got a thing here that lets you flip between the test system and the live system. You punch in the endpoint you want and you press go. You can pick the API version that you're testing. And what this gives you is effectively like a, um, you know, like a REPL loop for running API queries. So you authenticate, you go, and this is our discovery endpoint. It says these are the places where you can go with the credentials you gave us. Now, all of this is coming back from our API server as plain JSON, and then it's the web browser that's running the code that turns it into this explorable system. But we've even gone to the extent of saying, OK, well, now we've got these navigable links, but also we have these operations, because there are some things on this API where you can actually you can create things, you can update things, you can delete things. So here's an example. We've got a profile here for an actor who's 1 meter 8. We're going to go and we're going to change them to be 1 meter 9 using this, this HTTP update. Now, doing that, one, all of the stuff you're sending back there, the requests, the responses, they all show up in your browser's network history. So you can see, without having to run specialist tools, exactly what you sent and exactly what you got back. But the other thing is, if you want to try something out, you know, the people who are integrating with our system, if they want to just remind themselves what something looks like or try out a particular operation or try and, and you know, fix something, hack something, test something, they don't need to go out and fire up a little console application in order to do it. They can just open a web browser. And it's amazing kind of how much this uh, alleviates the sort of burden of maintaining documentation when you can create this kind of visibility onto what the system itself is actually doing. And that idea of sort of you know, transparency, of, of giving people insights into the way a system works, leads us on to the next thing we're going to talk about, which is the idea of monitoring. So you've written your code. Great. That's one set of user experiences is the collaborators on your development team the other devs who you're working with. Now that code is in production. Now you know the code works because you ran some unit tests when you deployed it 11 weeks ago. What's it doing now? You know, Has anything changed in the 11 weeks since this code went into production? The code probably hasn't unless someone has done something. But there are all sorts of other variables and factors that can affect the way code behaves when it's actually running. So. You get the, the phone call, the red telephone, the, the pager duty, or the slack alarm, or whatever goes off. And the person on the other end says, hello, there's a problem with the system. And you're like, OK, uh, can you give me some more details? And they're like, yeah, it, it's the system, and it doesn't work. And you're like, OK, I'm terribly sorry, you know, really sorry. We'll uh, get right onto that straight away. Let me take your, your number and, and give you a call back when it's done. So you got it down, you hang the phone up. And you, the second you put the phone down, it rings again. You pick it up again. You're like, hello. And someone says, yeah, the system's not working. And so, OK, thank you very much for letting me know. We're really sorry you go through this. You know, about the 10th the person you get onto is someone you're like, oh, OK, yeah, I, we've spoken before. I know that you know a fair bit about this. You're talking through sending you a screenshot because you have no idea. You know, all you know is that the phone keeps ringing and the system doesn't work. You don't even know which system. So they finally, you know, they, they do a screen grab and they email it over to you and, and you get this. 
and it just says the request timed out, and you're like, okay. Well, it's a start, but it doesn't really get you anywhere. You know, you're looking at maybe 100,000 lines of code in this code base, and maybe 20% of them are something to do with HTTP requests. So, okay, you've got 20,000 lines of code. And your boss is like, how long is it going to take to fix? You're like, well, it's 20,000 lines of code. I can probably check a line of code every five minutes. Uh, statistically, I'll get there in the middle, so you go and do the arithmetic. I didn't get on with fixing this problem. You've got no idea. You, know, you, you don't know where to even begin looking, at, looking into this problem because all you've got is the, a request timed out from somewhere. And you know it's on a production system because the phone's ringing and people are unhappy. But that's all you've got to go on. You know, it's this again. It's, it's the brick wall. It's dead end. There's nothing to help you. Nowhere to tell you where to get started. You just start you know, picking things at random and hoping maybe that's where the problem is. So another scenario is you get in and you have a wall. You have a, a big video display up on the wall in, in your department at work. Um, and you know, you're sat there typing away and you notice that suddenly some of the monitoring panels on that wall have gone red. The phone hasn't even rung yet. At this point, maybe nobody else has even noticed. And immediately you're like, okay, what systems are these? Right, so we got a problem here with the WWW and the content delivery network and intranet. So first thing, all this other stuff is still good. Don't even worry about looking at it. Second thing, all right, well, we know that the CDN actually delivers content to both of these things, so probably that one's down and that one's down because that one's down. You go in, you start digging, you know? You pretty quickly discover, okay, there's some uh, files which contain, uh, you know, invalid bytecode or Unicode headers have been uploaded to the CDN, and one of our proxies is trying to cache them, and it's choking. You're like, okay, so immediate fix, we'll remove the content. Your boss says, how long is it gonna take? You're like, well, we'll have the website back up in two minutes. We'll raise a ticket to fix it by improving the proxying policy on that box. That should take a couple of days. If it happens again in the meantime, we know what to do to fix it. The whole process is much more managed. You know, you have this immediate visibility. Probably didn't even get as far as anyone phoning you to say that there's a problem with the system. You know? This is good. Now, the other lovely thing that we've discovered having, I mean, this is actually a, a photograph of the screen we have on the wall above my desk in our office. If someone comes over to hassle you about staff reviews or you haven't RSVP'd with your menu choices for the Christmas party and they see that this wall is red, they stop and they think, hang on, this might not be a good time. <laughs> and what's even better is sometimes they come over, they'll look at the wall and they'll be like, is everything okay? Do you need anything? Can I get you a cup of coffee or something? This is a brilliant, it's a really simple way of creating this kind of transparency, because everyone can see it. And everyone subconsciously, everyone walks past this in my place on their way to the meeting room. So everyone who goes into a meeting looks up, they're like, it's all green. If they see red, they're like, maybe there's a problem. Maybe I can help. Maybe there's something I can do here. It's a kind of really good way of creating sort of buy-in and a level of understanding and just alleviating a lot of those frictions where someone's like, oh, you haven't RSVP'd for the staff party yet. And you're like, piss off. I'm trying to fix a production priority issue right now. And, you know, that's not a good, both people leave that conversation feeling fed up. They come over, they see the red, they're like, can I get you a sandwich or anything? Do you think this is going to take long? It's just a much, much nicer way of, I mean, you still have a problem because your main website's still down, but it's a much nicer way of dealing with it. Um, now, one of the tem uh, sort of tendencies with monitoring and that kind of thing is just to put warning lights on everything, every single system, and you end up with this. Um, this is the flight deck of the Space Shuttle Discovery. This is not for novices. This is not a, there, is, there is no nice learning curve for this system. There's 10 years of training in simulators and you know, reading hands-on tech manuals and everything. What you want to do with monitoring is you want to create a level of granularity that kind of gives you just enough information to know, is this really urgent and where do I start looking? You don't want that, you want this. So most cars have you know, maybe half a dozen lights on the dashboard. They don't have a light for every single component and system and moving part in a modern fuel-injected engine, because that would be crazy. What they have is a bunch of lights that say the brakes, the ABS, petrol, you know, um, thingy, uh, frost on the road. There's a problem with the engine. There's a problem with the ignition coil. Just enough for you to go, okay, one, is it safe to drive this thing, or should I just phone the garage? And two, you take it to the garage, and they're like, what's the problem? You're like, the little, little light that looks like a spring came on. They're like, all right. We'll take it from here. It gives you that kind of level of granularity, early visibility. That whole idea about you know, creating transparency and putting these systems up where people can see them. One of the things that I, I love about Star Trek Next Generation is 
heavily seen sit in the engine room, and the engine is right there, you know, just sat in the middle. It's not hidden behind a, a bulkhead or a cover or something. It's kind of part of the prop of the show. You can see it. You get this very real sense that you're on a starship, and everyone, after watching a couple of episodes, knows that this thing's supposed to be full of blue light, and it's supposed to sort of go wub, wub, wub. And if it stops doing that, that's probably what the story of this episode's going to be about, you know? Um, it's actually... <laughs> One of the things I love about this is that what's actually in here is gin and tonic with an ultraviolet lamp in it. Because the, the gin and tonic will fluoresce blue under ultraviolet light, and that's how they do nuclear reactors and warp drives and stuff on, on special effects slots. Um, so yeah, there you go. You learned something else today. Um, but you know, I, I love this idea of transparency and exposing things. And you can go a level beyond. So monitoring is all about, let's take that system over there and kind of poke the inputs and test the outputs. But you can go a level beyond that. That's kind of black box monitoring. You don't know what's inside the system, but you know that it has a certain set of inputs and outputs it's supposed to satisfy, and so we're going to test those. You can go a step further, and you can say, well, why are we building black boxes and then asking our team to tell us if they're working? You know, If we want to know if it's working, why not expose the internals? Why not actually make it what they call white box or you know, glass box testing? Now, I do a lot of work with Nancy, which is a .NET HTTP framework, sort of alternative to, to Web API, which I absolutely love, and I think it's brilliant. And one of the things that Nancy gives you out of the box for free is it has this built-in dashboard system. So if you set up a Nancy application, um, you put a password in the config file, and then you just go to my app slash underscore Nancy, and you punch in the password. And then what this actually gives you is kind of real-time live diagnostics on what's actually happening inside the system right now. So you can do some really clever stuff. You can go in, you can have a look at settings, you know, what's actually been configured. So this is what Nancy is running. There's a lot of useful stuff. So, you know, when we deployed this, where did it actually deploy to? You ever had that problem where you spend half an hour debugging an application and then you realize the code you're reading isn't the same as the code that's in production? This gives you immediate visibility on that. There's a diagnostic provider and a root cache you can actually go into and look at all of the routes that have ended up being run by the system after it had bootstrapped and initialized itself. Because there's mistakes you can make in dynamic languages which won't get caught by the compiler. The only place they'll show up is that a whole bunch of this stuff just won't happen. You can even go in and you can switch on request tracing on a production system temporarily. And then you can go in and make a bunch of requests, go into any one of those requests and see what was the method, what was the path, what were all the results, what were all of the headers. So, it's almost like being able to do a forensic analysis in real time of a production system with almost no footprint. You go in, you isolate the traffic that you're interested in to a single server in your, in your load balancer in your cluster, you switch on request tracing, leave it running for a couple of seconds, switch it off again, and then you're like, right, there's all the traffic. And that gives you this wealth of information that you can use to try and ascertain where has this problem come from? Is there anything here that we need to worry about? Is there something not right? Are we being you know, hammered with, with traffic? Is someone trying to DDoS us? All these, these kinds of things. Now, there's a sort of frequent case you'll get where someone says, we've got a problem. What's the problem? The database server's at 100% CPU, and that's why nothing's working. Now, that's one, you know, that's good. That's a data point that says we have CPU monitoring on our database. Now, what I want to know is, OK, how did it get there? Is the database server, did it? You know, was it fine six months ago, and it's been gradually getting higher and higher and higher and higher and higher, and it's only now that we've noticed? Or does it spike at 2 o'clock every morning when we're doing the backups and then drop back down to zero, and then spike and then drop back down to zero? Or was it absolutely fine until we did a production deployment 10 minutes ago, and now suddenly it's at 100%? Because the symptom is the same. You've got 100% CPU. But in order to actually work out what to do about it, Knowing that you have a problem right now is not enough. You need to know what it looked like yesterday. What did it look like the day before? What's your sort of profile for that over the last six months? And the way to get this is logging, capturing historical data about what your systems, you know, your hosting infrastructure is actually doing. Um, so this is a, a tool that's called Redgate SQL Monitor. It's a SQL uh, monitoring tool for SQL Server databases. I absolutely love this because it's stupidly easy to use. It's really easy to install. It explains what all of the things in it actually mean. And it gives you this very, very easy way of saying, I want to compare today to yesterday. So this is our live production database system. This is what it looks like on weekdays. You know, it's kind of quiet overnight. We have this massive spike here, which is us running our overnight backups. Then everything kind of dies down a little bit. Then about 10 o'clock in the morning, all of the actors and agents and people, they get into the office and start poking around at things. 
Um, they go and have a nice lunch, they work quite hard all afternoon, and at six o'clock, everyone disappears. Because the ones who are working go to the theater, and the ones who aren't working go to the pub. Because that's how our industry works. We know this, you know. This is a pretty regular pattern. And when we see something unusual, it's interesting. Because, you know, suddenly it's like we have a massive spike here that's just come up at uh, six o'clock in the morning. You know, what's going on? And then you'll be like, it turns out that somebody in Moscow or somebody in, in Eastern Europe or somebody in the Far East has actually just put a job out on our system, which is so interesting that people are waking each other up to go and look at it. And you're like, okay, that's pretty cool. We had a bunch of stuff go out with Star Wars, which was sent out from the States, different time zone. We started getting database spikes at unusual times. That's interesting, you know? So we got a database spike. Was it Star Wars? No. Okay, then maybe we have a problem. This is the kind of diagnostic you want. But also you can superimpose it. What did today look like compared to yesterday? What did today look like? What's our growth profile look like over the last three months? Because then that's the point where instead of going, we just hit 100% CPU, quickly, can we get more capacity? You can sit down and go, OK, current projections, we're going to need a bigger database in three months. And either they're like, OK, we'll put it in the budget, or we can't get a bigger database. We need a new sharding strategy. We need to move some of our storage onto a separate box. We need to start caching some of this stuff. Having this sort of visibility stops those crises happening, because it means that you can kind of almost see into the future and predict when things are going to take place. So that's monitoring. That's logging. You know, monitoring is about what's happening right now. This kind of infrastructure logging is about what was the system doing, what were the servers and the network and the infrastructure doing. The last part of the talk tonight is about application logging. What was my code doing at the point where the thing happened that everyone is suddenly very interested in? Um, now, one of the, the sort of challenges that you have with the, the whole idea of logging, you want to get it central. Has anyone here ever had a server fail because it filled up its own C drive with log files and it couldn't boot anymore? Yeah. I've had that, like, I couldn't put my hands up enough times for how often that happened to me. It's an absolute classic. You're like, we need some logs for this. We'll switch them on in case we need them later. So someone goes, yeah, switch on logging, verbose logging for everything. And then you forget about it. And it just sits there and it's spooling everything to C, INET, pub log files, or you know wherever it went. Um, and then the server crashes. And of course, at that point, one, it doesn't help that you've got these log files because they're all on a server which is no longer accessible because it won't boot because it doesn't have any disk space. And two, the thing that you did to stop you having a problem has actually caused the biggest problem you've had in months. So you know the absolute golden rule of logging on any kind of distributed system, even if it's just two web servers running in a, in a sort of high availability pair, get the logs off the server and get them onto something centralized. Now, it doesn't matter what that is. You could be sending them into a database. You could be sending them into some sort of software as a service. There are dozens of these systems. None of them is actually dreadful. They have varying degrees of how much money they cost versus how much maintenance they require. But the whole point is you want to get your logging off your systems and onto something central. And ideally, if you're running multiple applications, you want all of them to be pushing their logs to the same place so that you have this holistic view of all the stuff that's running on your stack and how it's interacting. Now, we have this convention in application logging in .NET, which I think goes all the way back to the, the early versions of Apache, which is that there's these five levels that you can use to log things. So fatal error, warn, info, debug. Now, it kind of doesn't matter as long as everyone's using them for the same thing. But it's really important to have some kind of consensus. If you've got different people logging to the same place, there needs to be understanding between those teams and those systems as to what these different levels actually signify. So the convention that we use for this, so fatal error means it's totally unresponsive, multiple users are affected, stop what you're doing, look into it. Now, in most organizations, there will be systems that cannot have a fatal error because the system is not important enough. If you have a, uh, something that runs a report at 3 o'clock every Tuesday afternoon, and it sends to someone so they know how many lunches to order for the meeting the next day, does it matter if that system fails on Friday night? It's not fatal. You know? don't want to you know, call people out and get them out of bed and say, hey, you need to go and fix this now. Why? Well, we need it on Tuesday afternoon. It's like, well, we'll fix it on Tuesday morning. You know? That's not, there are some systems that just cannot cause a fatal error because they're not that significant to what's going on right now. Errors and warnings, the distinction that I always use between these, you know, they, they happen. You build code that you think is brilliant, and then you hit the fallacies of distributed computing, and you know, there's a problem with the network. You try and make an API call, nothing comes back. OK, well, what do you do? Maybe you can handle it. Maybe you, know, maybe you can ignore it. Maybe you're like, OK, we couldn't get live exchange rates. All right, well, we'll use the ones we have in the cache from five minutes ago. We'll use the ones we have in the cache from yesterday. 
you probably don't want to use the ones you have in the cash from last month because at that point you're going to start losing money if exchange rates are drifting. Now, the distinction I make with these, you know, a warning is something you can recover from gracefully, so you don't actually need to tell the user about it. An error for me is the kind of thing that they just say to the user, we're very sorry, please try again. You know, something it failed, they press F5, okay, next time it succeeds. Um, the whole point about these is you don't need to know about individual instances. What you want to track is the aggregates. It's like you see someone on the train in fancy dress, yeah, it happens. You see this, that means something interesting is going on, yeah? <laughs> If you get a thousand warnings in a minute, you're like, well, how many warnings do we normally get in a minute? Someone says, maybe one. You know? Now, customers haven't noticed. The system's still working because the warnings are just being suppressed. But the fact you've just had a thousand of them probably means you need to stop what you're doing and, and go and look into it. <coughs> info is everything fine. You know, the, the reason why I use info logging, so you come into work after a long weekend, you've got to check the logs, the logs are empty. Now, there's two possible explanations. One, everything worked flawlessly for 72 hours. Two, your logging infrastructure fell down on Friday night just after you left. One of these is far more likely than the other. Info is the thing that just says, no, it, it's actually fine. There were no errors this weekend. You've got info every 10 minutes going, you know, recycling the application pool, we're bringing another server up, we're shutting a server down because we're quiet. This is just, you know, kind of reassuring three o'clock and all is well type messages. Um, and finally, there's debug. Now, one of the best habits that I think we as developers can get into is the second you start going for console.write line, stop, install a logging framework, use debug.login or log.debug instead. Because you can leave those lines in. So anything you're doing where you're like, I need a bit more insight into what this code is doing because it's a bit complicated and I want some visibility on how it works. Use uh, log debugging to do that. You can print it to the console, you can print it to a file, you can print it to a network trace. When you deploy, you leave the lines in and you switch it off, which means you can log everything. You know, whatever detail was useful to you as a developer when you built it is probably going to be useful to somebody else. Maybe you in six months' time when you can't remember how you did it last time. Maybe when something fails in production. Log all the things. Which way you're like, well, all the things? Yeah. Because the point is you can switch it off. In almost every mature framework, you can just say, all right, when you go to production, don't log the debug messages. Just dis silently discard those. It'll cost you like one CPU instruction to go, okay, don't do that, and it's fine. And you've still got info, you've still got the warnings, you've still got the, the fatals and the errors. And then when you do get that you know, application issue that you cannot reproduce locally and you can't reproduce it on dev and it's been happening for days now, all you can do, you can go onto production and you can say, right, let's deploy the same code, but this time I'm gonna switch debugging on. Because when it's 3 o'clock in the morning and you're there you know, hacking away and looking at it, you can actually get that same information that you used on your workstation when you were building the thing in the first place. You can get those logs off all your production systems being fed into log entries or Logit or Splunk or whatever the platform you're using is. You can see exactly what's going on down to this you know, almost excruciating level of detail. And that's what's going to help you work out what this one really weird production bug that you're seeing is. Um, you could actually, this whole kind of confusion around this, what I wish they'd done, is they just, they'd not called them fatal error warn info debug. They should have been called wake me at 4 a.m. on a Sunday. You know, you don't write that in your code unless that's what you want to happen. You know, you don't be like wake me at 4 a.m. on a Sunday just to say user logged in. <laughs> you know, <laughs> apologize to user and raise a ticket because you're like, yeah, and I should probably say sorry when I write the exception message for this. Make a note in case it happens again. Let's put this in a bucket and if the bucket fills up, we should wake somebody up. Everything's fine, just checking in, and log.debug should be called fill my C drive with stack traces. Because if you forget to switch it off or configure it properly, that's what it's going to do. Um, this, by the way, is a guy called Daniel Librero who wrote this great blog post about how all the logging levels had the wrong names and they, they should have done this. So the, uh, credit to him for the, the idea on this one. Um, and that kind of wraps it up. So, you know, to recap, we've, we've looked at a whole bunch of different aspects of developing software and shipping software and working and collaborating and stuff. Um, so I'm just going to you know, run through recap on, on what I think are the rules of happy code. Um, so the first one you know, is, is Applejack, is names. If you're building a system, give it a name. Names make things friendly. Names make things, you know, they, they give you ways of delineating concepts in a distributed application. And use them. You know? GitHub repository, give it a name. Wiki, same name. Error messages, the same name. You build your centralized logging infrastructure, it's like, hey, let's go and have a look at the Applejack logs. And don't worry too much about what they mean. You know, I was talking with a, a friend of mine recently. He's like, yeah, I was, I was looking at Octopus Deploy, but I didn't want to install something on my server called a tentacle. And I was like, dude, just 
you, what, you want another thing called agent in this business, really? Like, give it a name that doesn't mean anything else. Don't call it database, you probably have one of those. Don't call it website, you probably have one of those. Don't call it API, don't call it service. Call it Applejack or Isla or, you know, anything, Canberra. Just give it a name that's going to make people go, hang on, I don't know what this is. And they'll put their hand up in the meeting and go, sorry, what was Canberra? And you'll be like, oh, Canberra is the thing that turns the PDF invoices and sends them by email. They'll be like, okay. And they, they can fill in a little kind of piece of their, their mental map of the solution. Learning curves. Steep, shallow, it doesn't really matter. Avoid the localized peaks. Make them smooth. Watch out for brick walls. Brick walls are bad. Never ever throw an exception that says the operation failed, unspecified error. You know, you know what went wrong because you wrote the exception message. Don't ever be scared of putting as much detail as you can possibly think of into those exceptions because it'll probably be you in six months' time going, what the hell's unspecified error, you know? <laughs> Verbose error messages. Don't do this. That's bad. Do that, you know? If you can fix it by putting the config in the exception, do it. <coughs> Signposting. You know, if you're building APIs, make them explorable. If you're building class libraries, put IntelliSense comments and documentation on them. Think about how you can stop the user having to, you know, open the docs or read the manual or whatever it is they have to do. There's going to be points where you're like, well, you've got this far. I know that there's three different things you can do here. You can open the database connection or you can configure end-to-end -end encryption or you can specify some credentials. Maybe I can expose those three things as the only options from the, the config object that you're, you're building. Transparency, you know, remember the, the engine room, remember the big screen on the wall. Let people see what's going on. Don't hide stuff behind covers. Create transparency, use a decent level of abstraction, wait until the screen goes red and people come over and ask if you need a cup of coffee or want someone to go and grab you some sandwiches. It's lovely when that happens because they feel like they're helping fix the problem as well. And then you actually got everyone on the same side and it's you and all your team trying to fix the thing that we don't know why it broke, but we're going to get to the bottom of it. Um, it's a really great way of, of creating visibility and creating buy-in. <laughs> and the, the one rule to rule them all is don't forget you're creating user experiences. You know, whatever you're doing, unless you're going to write code that you're going to run once and then you're going to delete it and never run it again, somebody is going to end up running the code that you wrote. Whether they're integrating with your API, they're querying your database, they're running your DLLs, they've downloaded your open source project, you know, they're the engineer who's on call when it blows up in the middle of the night. Somebody is going to have a good day or a bad day depending on the decisions that you make when you build your code. And you want them to go home looking like this guy here. Thank you very much.